Hi, my name is Josh Potter, and I'm the lead pastor here at Sioux City First Church. I want to take a moment to thank you for watching today's video. I truly hope that you find it life-giving, challenging, and encouraging. We do want to get to know you beyond a YouTube video, so I want to encourage you, go and visit our website, SiouxCityFirst.org. You'll find lots of information there, ways to connect with us, ways to give to support what we're doing here at the church. But just want to give you an opportunity to get to know us a little bit more by going to the website. Once again, we'd love to meet you in person and hopefully you can join us soon. Otherwise, go visit our website. We hope that you have a great week and we hope that you're inspired by today's message. Thank you. Have a great week. I don't know about you, but I love a good comeback story. Uh, I love seeing them, unless, of course, it's against my team, then I don't like them. But I love comeback stories. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big sports fan, and uh, I love what, what God has done through Pastor Tyler and Grace's life. But uh, one of the things that I love about sports is, is it gives us the opportunity to, to take someone who might be favored to win a game and other team, another team to win. Uh, one of my favorite comeback stories this year was Matthew Stafford. He played for the Lions for several years, and if you don't know the Lions, I don't want to offend you this morning, but they were not a very good team. And he played for them for several years, and uh, he, he, he didn't win a whole lot of games. He went from one of the worst teams to the Rams, and then they eventually were the best team last year, or at least they won on the day that they needed to win at the end of the season. They won the Super Bowl last year. I love his story and just who he is, his family, what he's about. Uh, and then last week was the Masters, and at the Masters, uh, Tiger Woods was back. Uh, if you don't know, last year he got in a severe car accident and almost lost his whole leg. And so to be able to play in the Masters and swing and everything that goes along with golf and walking 72 holes, all of that, I just love watching those stories of comeback stories of someone that was down and out, there was no way out, no way forward, and God provided a way out, and... The Easter story is one of my favorite stories for that reason. There is no greater comeback story in history than the story of Jesus Christ coming back from the dead. And that's what we're here to celebrate this morning. That's why I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Because here's what we believe. We believe that God specializes in raising dead things back to life. That's what he does. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar or not, but in scripture, there were a lot of people who were actually raised from the dead. Jesus was, but there were several other people who were raised from the dead. I want to share some of those with you this morning. Back in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah raised the son of the Z uh, Zarephath woman, widow, from the dead. It's one person that was raised from the dead. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha raised the son of the Shunammite woman from the dead. Later on, after Elisha had passed away, he was dead for about... 20 years, 2 Kings chapter 13 tells us that a man was raised from the dead simply because his body touched Elisha's bones. And we talked about this a few weeks ago here at the church that our impact can outlive our natural life. What an amazing story. A guy who has been dead for 20 years suddenly bringing another person back to life. Jesus raised the son of the widow of Nain from the dead in Luke chapter 7. Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead in Luke chapter 8. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Most of you probably have heard that story. Lazarus, come forth. Peter raised Dorcas. Okay, if you're having children, I wouldn't recommend that name. It's an unfortunate name. But Peter raised Dorcas from the dead in Acts chapter 9. And then in Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul was preaching a really long message and there was a guy listening to his message, and he got so tired that he fell asleep during Paul preaching, and he fell out of his window. Eutychus fell out of a window three stories and died. I once heard a pastor say, Eutychus too if you would have fallen out of a three-story window. But he came, and they went, and they prayed with him, and, and he was raised to life. And then we know Jesus and all the Gospels that tells us that Jesus rose from the dead. God raised him. From the dead. Jesus' death was different than everybody else's death, though. None of the other, de none of the other people that were raised to life, their, their, their resurrection doesn't compare with Jesus. One of the reasons why is because Jesus was the only one who went on to live forever. All of those other people, they were healed and they were resurrected, but it was only temporary. They eventually went on to, to die. 
The other thing about Jesus, unlike all of those people, Jesus was sinless. And that's why what happened on the cross was so, so important. He lived a sinless life. And when he died on the cross, he was the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. The other thing that Jesus did when he was raised from the dead was he fulfilled prophecy. Several prophecies, hundreds and hundreds of years old, and he fulfilled them simply by being raised from the dead. The other thing that I love about the resurrection of Jesus and his death on the cross, it covers our sin. There's no greater thing that Jesus has done than to cover our sin, but then he also covers our sin and he promises us eternal life. And so we are so thankful for what Jesus has done on the cross because God specializes in raising dead things back to life. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Matthew chapter 25. If you don't have one, there's one in front of you. You could grab your iPhone out or whatever lesser quality device you might have with you and go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, we're going to look at verse number 5. Now, if you don't know the story, at this point, Jesus has been betrayed by one of his 12 disciples. And they, they uh, arrested him for 30 pieces of silver. His, his, his disciple turned him in. He was arrested. He was tried. And then we know that he was whipped 39 times across his back. 39 times with, with bones and, and glass and ripping apart his back. And a crown of thorns was, was pushed upon his head. He was spit at. He was mocked. He was cursed at. Then they drove nails through his hands and his feet. And then at the very end, they took a spear and they shoved it in his side. And he died an agonizing death that you and I actually deserve, but he died it for us so that we could have life. And so Jesus is dead. He has been in the tomb now. And we're going to move to the story where the angels have come. There was this earthquake, and these angels, this angel is, really, is sitting on top of the, the stone. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 5. It says, the angel said to the women, there was a couple of women that went there, Mary, Martha, and some other women. They went there to the tomb because Jesus had been dead, and they expected his body to start to smell. Obviously, there was, uh, they were afraid of decomposition, and so they went there believing he was dead. So they got their essential oils out. They went to the tomb. They get there. And it says this. It's a, the angel begins to speak to the women. And he says, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Now I'm going to stop there for a second. Because Jesus told them he was going to do it. He told them he was going to die, die. He told them that he was going to be raised from the dead. And yet they still went thinking that they had to bring these spices and fragrances to help a decomposing body. Verse number 7, it says, After you come and see the place he lays, then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, again, yet, uh, excuse me, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Verse 9, it says, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. Now, keep in mind, they think Jesus, they thought he was dead. Now they're going to tell the disciples, and Jesus suddenly shows up on a road to see them, and his first words are, greetings, okay? I don't know what you'd be thinking in that situation, but I'd, I'd, it'd be amazing. Greetings. It says, they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Verse 10, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. I love the resurrection story because it tells us a lot about God and one of the things that we, we, we should understand from this story, and one thing we should understand about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is this, that our response to the resurrection should be the same as those women that met him. Our response to the resurrection is worship. He deserves it. Us thanking him for what he has done. Us adoring him for what he has done. He fulfilled prophecy. He is who he says he is. He, 
uh, he came back to life just as he said he would. We have so much to worship him for. You know, we were singing those songs earlier and worshiping the Lord. We have so much to worship the Lord over. And our response to him being raised from the dead, fulfilling scripture, is worship. The other response to the resurrection is to go and tell. You see the angels say, go and tell. Jesus says, go and tell. The message of the good news is not just for you. I believe that if you were the only person on this earth, I believe that Jesus Christ would have come and he would have died for you. But there are a lot of other people on this earth that need Jesus Christ. And while it's a good message for us, it's the good news for everybody else who hasn't heard. And so he tells us that we should go and tell. We need to let people know that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. We need to tell people about the, the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's our responsibility to go and to tell. That's what our response should be to the gospel. Because we live in a world where a lot of people have no hope. We live in a world where a lot of people have no way out of the situation that they find themselves in. There's no way forward in their life. And you have to, I want you to put yourself in the disciples' shoes that morning. Or the women's shoes that morning. After he was, he was killed on the cross. What are they thinking? Jesus is dead. This one who is supposedly the Messiah is dead. Imagine the discouragement you might feel. Imagine the discouragement that they had to feel. There was no hope. There's no way. They're just going to the tomb to, to take some spices. But the God of the impossible showed up. And the Bible tells us in, in Luke 1, 37, it says, nothing is impossible with God. Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made, excuse me, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for God. No matter what, you're, what season of life you're in, no matter what you're facing right now, nothing is too hard for God him. So I want you to think about your life right now. What are some areas in your life where you might be feeling there is no hope? Maybe you're feeling there's no way out. There's no way forward with what I'm dealing with right now. Some of us have been in a marriage like that before. Feels like there's, it, it's, it's broken. There's no hope. Should we stay together? Should we get divorced? What do we do with the kids? Your marriage is on life support. Some of us have experienced that before. Some of us have had friendships, people who we were really, really close to who we have no relationship with anymore. There are people who, maybe they were your best friend, and whether it's because of COVID or whether because of politics or whatever it may have been, you are not in a good relationship with them anymore and your friendship has been fractured. It's on life support right now. What about your, your work life? Some of you are here and you absolutely dread going to work every single day. Your work is sucking the life out of you every single day. You need someone to breathe new life into it. What about your financial situation? Some of you are here and you're saying, uh, my finances, hello. Yeah, they're on life support. We know what that feels like. You know, because of COVID and just life and what we've experienced, anxiety is higher than it's ever been before. Depression is higher. Maybe your anxiety, you just feel so paralyzed by what it does to you when you feel those moments rise up. You're depressed. You're, you have no hope. It's hard to get out of bed in the morning. It's hard to go to work. It's hard to face people in your life. I'm, I want to remind you this morning that God specializes in bringing dead things back to life. You know, one thing is a common denominator for all of those things, and it's that it's our spiritual lives. And for some of us, our spiritual life is either dead, it's non-existent, or it's on life support. The Bible tells us that we were all dead in our sin. Every single one of us in this room, there's no exceptions. None of you, and myself included, none of us were ever good enough. The Bible tells us that we were dead in our sin. In, in Romans chapter 6, verse number 4, 
It says, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You can live a new life. We don't have to continue in those ways. As Pastor Tyler said, the old way is gone. Behold, the new has come. We were all dead in our sin before, but Jesus is offering you and he's offering me new life in him. Romans 3.10, it says this, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's some really great people in this room, but none of us were ever good enough to get to heaven on our own. There had to be a sacrifice, which was Jesus. Romans 3.23, you've probably heard that before. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That word fall there, it means continually. It isn't you, you fell short one time, you made a mistake. It's that we continually go down that path and we need God's grace on a regular basis. Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages or for the payment of sin. The wages, what you'll be paid. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Every one of us deserved death, but Jesus has come to give us life and life to the full. So what I want to propose and what I want to encourage you with is this. A life lived for God is a life resurrected. It's God taking what was and making it new. It's taking what was dead and making it alive again. He will resurrect the dead things of your life. He'll resurrect our, our, our lives from the sin that has held us down and held us captive for years. I want to encourage you to make today the beginning of your comeback story. I want to encourage you to invite God into your life. Now, I kind of grew up in church, I don't know about you, and I always heard about, you know, inviting Jesus into your life or asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Um, uh, you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and you hear all those things kind of in, and it's kind of churchy words, and so I want to really tell you, what does it mean to invite God into your life? Here's a few things that it brings when you make that decision. It means that you can have communication with God means that you can talk to him. Just like I'm talking to you, you can talk to God now. You can just have conversation with him. God, thank you for all that you've done in my life. God, where are you? Did you forget that I'm alive? You can have any conversation with God. You can have conversation with God through prayer. God, I, I need you. God, I'm thankful. God, thank you for my children. Thank you for my spouse. Thank you for my job. Thank you for all these things. God, I need help in this area. God, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm depressed. I, I need help with work. We can communicate with God. It opens up a new relationship, someone that you can walk through life with like never before. We can communicate with God through Scripture, and, and He has given us this thing called a Bible that we can have. Now, you've probably noticed this. There's a lot of other books that are written about God. There's a lot of really great books that are written about God and, and Scripture and all of that. Even if there was never, ever another book written about God, this book would have been enough. It tells us everything we need to know about God and who he is. And it's essentially God saying, here's who I am. The other thing that happens when we invite God into our life is we belong to a new family. We have a new family that we get to, to walk along with. Some of you are in here and you're like, I love my family. I have a great family. Others of you are like, I like this idea of a new family. <laughs> I like the idea of having some other people in my life who will walk with it and support me. But we have a family to walk through life with people who, who come alongside us in the best of times and the worst of times. The other thing that it gives us when we invite God into our life, it gives us a hope for our future. If you were to look around at the world right now, if you were to look around and see all the things we see in the Ukraine and just the world all around us, It'd be easy to lose hope. But when we invite God into our life, we have hope. Even in the worst of worst situations, we can still have hope that one day we'll get to go and spend eternity with him. One of my favorite things about having God in my life is it gives me a joy. A joy in life. It gives me peace in my life. The Bible says that we can have a peace that goes beyond our understanding. You can have peace in the middle of chaos. It gives us forgiveness. 
the greatest gift you'll ever receive is that Jesus Christ forgives you of your sins. And he makes you new. And not only that, but not only can we receive forgiveness, but we can extend forgiveness. Most of us, we may not be willing to do that until God comes in our life and then we can begin to forgive people for what they've done. It gives us a new love for people, compassion. There are so many things that it does, but when we invite God into our life, we ask him pretty simply. We just ask him, we acknowledge that we're sinners. We believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And then we just say, God, I want to follow you. Just like the disciples, Jesus said, come, follow me. And that's all we're doing is we're saying, Jesus is saying that to us this morning, come, follow me. Now in just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to respond to that, to inviting God into your life. And I know some of you in this room, or many of you in this room who know who God is and you have a relationship with God. I want to once again remind you to invite God into your marriage. Invite God into your relationships, your friendships, or you as mom and dad or son or daughter. Invite God into your finances, your friendships, your work life, your recreational life. Invite God into the pain. Invite God into your anxiety. Invite God into your depression. Invite him into your addiction. Invite him into all of those things. He will walk with you through those. Let me just encourage you something else. Invite someone else in that journey. You don't have to go through those things all by yourself. There's other people who want to walk that journey with you, who want to help you along that journey. In just a moment, we're going to take, give you an opportunity to respond. I think it's important to respond to every single time God may be speaking to us in a venue like this where God has is, is, is brought you here. I don't believe that you're here by some accident. Even if your mom and dad made you come to church today, or your, your spouse brought you to church today, I believe God divinely brought you here because he loves you and he cares about you. And so in just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to that. And then I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to pray together as, as a group of people all together in this room. So I'm going to invite the worship team if they would come forward this morning and then after we do that we're just going to kind of go out with a little bit of a celebration thanking God for who he is and what he does and how he helps us in our life but I want you to just begin to think in your mind right now let us reflect for a couple moments just ask you the question have you invited God to be in your life like it's one thing to believe that there is a God it's another thing to let him Mark your steps and to guide your life and to walk with you every single day. It's another thing to have joy, peace, forgiveness, and love and hope for our future. It's another thing to have family to walk through life with. And so I just want to extend that invitation to you today. I want you to stand with me as we close and then we'll sing together. God specializes in raising dead things back to life. You may feel like this morning spiritually, you're just lost. Maybe you came in spiritually thinking, I'm good enough. God's just here to remind us, I want to invite you into fellowship with me. I want to invite you, I want to invite a relationship between us to fellowship with one another, communication between one another. So I want to, I'm going to ask everyone to bow your head this morning as we just pray. So we just reflect on what God may be speaking to each person. All of us came in here with different things, different thoughts, different spiritual patterns and rhythms. This morning as your head's bowed, as your eyes are closed, if you're here for the first time and needing Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, you want to invite God into your life, you've never done that before this morning, you you can do that. Some of you are here, maybe you grew up in church and you've drifted from the Lord. While it may seem like you've drifted, God has always, always been there. And he's here this morning. He wants to give you a firm foundation, a life to build upon. So you might need to just reconnect with God. You need to re-invite him, reconnect, recommit your life to him. 
So everyone's heads are bowed. No one's looking around. You don't have to be nervous or anxious about what someone may think about you. I just want to give you that opportunity to respond this morning and say, I want to invite God into my life. I've never done it, or I need to do it for the first time, or I need to recommit. I need to reconnect with God. I've, I've drifted, and I need God. Everyone's heads are bowed. Everyone's eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up just so I can be praying for you? I've been drifting from the Lord. put your hands down this morning let's just before we sing this song let's just take a moment to pray together I'm going to lead you in a prayer and I want you to repeat after me and we can all just do it together to support one another and really just make a fresh commitment to God this morning so if you're here and you raised your hand God does want to come into your life and forgive you to give you a new fresh start and so let's just take a moment to pray together if you would just repeat after me this morning dear Jesus Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for being raised from the dead. Thank you that you're here to forgive my sins. Today I confess that I'm a sinner. I'm in need of your grace. I'm in need of your forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. From this day forward, I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to pray together, to just give, give the opportunity for, for men and women to give their life to Jesus. God, we thank you for those hands that were raised. We thank you for those that say, God, I need a fresh start. God, I need to reconnect with you. Today's that opportunity. And so God, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're going to continue to do. We have so much to be thankful for this Easter that Jesus Christ was dead and he's alive forevermore. God, we just want to take this opportunity to say thank you one more time as we wrap up our service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this together.